The most powerful force in the Empire is the Sky Knights. This is the place where only the most talented knights and wizards can enter. A place where members are ranked according to strict skill-based systems. Age, gender, status are meaningless as the knights and wizards are judged by only their abilities. Among the knights and the wizards, the best 10 are bestowed the title of Imperial Knight. In the current generation, there was a man who was the strongest of all time. His name is Zenok Ivan Black Knight, the rank 1 leader of the Imperial Knights and captain of the Sky Knights. Despite being the only duke in the Empire, he is the youngest ever to become captain. Espen is the lieutenant of the Knights, the rank 2. Everyone disliked her despite her rank because of her ugly appearance. She was told that she will not be allowed to take her role in the upcoming victory ceremony. She protested that everyone except the captain competed for the role, which she became the winner. However, the boss explained that she should not show up because of the scar on her face. He said that the captain would be a more suitable candidate. Espen asked if she could wear a mask to cover up for her scar, but she was told to stay quiet. Her boss said that the dignity of the royal family must be maintained and that there is nothing she could do about it since it's been decided. Davian Shear, the rank 6 leader, walked up to Espen. He said he was surprised to hear that Espen had lost her place in the victory ceremony in spite of her bravery and victory against the other knights. He then tells Espen Espen, the captain will do a good job in her stead. Espen remembered her past life when she was a child. She lost her family in a fire incited by an unknown culprit. After the fire incident, Espen discovered that she had a great talent for swordsmanship. Back then, if she had been acknowledged by everyone, she might have been treated differently. The only reason why she was overshadowed despite being talented is because of Senok, who happens to be a wall that she can never surpass. She really hates him, and she wished that she could have the opportunity to prove herself against Senok and his abilities. She wondered how a man could be so perfect that it would cause her despair, but she doesn't want to live with an inferiority complex for the rest of her life. The story of the Sky Knights being ranked strictly by their abilities is now a thing of the past. Most of the powers now reside in the hands of nobles. Espen thought that it would only be a matter of time before the honorable place gets rotten as the ignorance of the nobles gets stronger. Espen remembered that she doesn't have any family or relatives. So day after day, she has been thinking about the meaning of life, feeling she has no place as a member of the Sky Knights any longer, and she decides to have a duel with the captain before taking her leave. She felt she could put an end to her hatred through swordplay. Captain Senok asks if Espen really wants to have a duel with him. He was surprised to see her talking and moving so close to him, and notices that Espen's hair is messy. It was raining outside the training hall. Senok asked if they could postpone the duel, but Espen said that she doesn't hate the rain and she appreciates the captain for being punctual. Then the duel begins. Espen decides to focus on Zenok's wrists, but Senok overpowers her and asks her to admit defeat. However, Espen decides to calm down and think positively. She believes that she'll be able to stand up again. She believed that she had a last chance to have a duel with Senok and that she could beat him. It was the last crucial moment she had to prove her worth, but she dropped her sword and threw in the towel. Then she walked along with Senok. Senok was a man she really liked. He was a figure that she'd always respected, but the inferiority complex she had developed because the hatred of the many people towards her had stopped her from seeing a good-looking and kind-hearted man. Alas, she still had her sword with her. That was all in imagination, and she's determined to make her fight with the captain her final fight. She focused on Senok's wrist, and she aimed for a cut on his side, but she realized that Senok had always been the type to never let down his guard. Suddenly, Espen's sword changed to what looked like lightning, and she got Senok on his knees. She pointed her sword onto him and asked if he'd blame the weather. The captain stood up and walked away from the seemingly triumphant Espen, who was happy to have gotten a win out of the hundreds of duels she had with him. She placed her hand on the part of the shoulder where she had been struck as the pain ached. She felt that there was no point in going anywhere because she had no family to welcome her home. She sees a rabbit walking aimlessly on the road as a carriage with a horse was approaching about to run it over. She decides to dive in and cover the rabbit amidst a violent collision with the horse and carriage. The rider halted. He drew closer with the aim of checking if Espen is alive or dead. She was satisfied with the victory as a knight, but she felt unhappy because her life was so short, but she didn't know death would give her new life. Espen found herself lying down in the woods. She felt so thirsty that she walked up to some water and was shocked to see that she had a young face and body. She lamented over the loss of her well-trained body, her honor, and strength as a knight as she felt noticeably slower. Then a small rabbit asked if she had come to her senses, but wait, this is no rabbit, but instead a creature that identified himself as Lepus, the king of sacred beasts. 
Espen remembered that Lepus was the same rabbit she had saved from the carriage before her death. She asked if the rabbit was the one responsible for her sudden transformation from a warring knight to an innocent girl. She grabbed Lepus and asked what he had done to her body. Lepus explained she died when the carriage crashed into her, and that he gave her a new body. He then explained that she was destined to die on that day regardless of whatever action she would have taken. The body he gave to Espen would only disappear if he stopped supplying it power, and he asked if she would like to continue living. Espen replied that she didn't want to die but instead live a quiet and peaceful life. Lepus tells her he'll only agree to her request if she fulfills his. Originally, Lepus ruled over the sacred beast from a different dimension, but one day, a hole was drilled between these dimensions and the beasts escaped. Lepus tells her she can only keep her body if she helps him recapture them. He then explains that they've been brought back 18 years into the past. Espen was thinking about how she was going to live in her new world when Lepus directs her to a nearby village. She thought about how she will have to live with the supernatural rabbit and found it difficult to believe she was sent back in time. Espen asks Lepus if he could make her look like an adult, but he doesn't have the power to do that at the moment. She then hears a young boy crying in the forest, and she finds out he's handsome and looked so much like the captain she knew before she died, thinking there's no way this could be Senna because her captain was not the type to be meek or emotional. She told the young boy to stop crying, but admitted she's not good with kids. She asks Lepus to do something about this, but apparently the king of beasts is only visible to her. We then learn the boy is being bullied by another group of boys his age, who are also being trained under the same sword teacher. The young boy said that his bully is a talented swordsman and his teacher's precious student, and his teacher didn't care about him since he was too scared to wield swords. Espen remembered that there are guys like the bullies during her times in the Knight's Order. These guys would pick on weak people and commoners and they would deliberately bully them. As the lieutenant, she would never never allow any act of injustice to go unpunished, and that was the reason why the high-ranking nobles hated her. She said the jerk who hits the boy is to be blamed and to fight back whenever they beat him up. The boy thanked her for the advice, and he said that it is impossible for him to fight back. Then the bullies arrived. Lepus tells Espen to prepare for a fight, but she wonders how she'll be able to fight in her tiny, fragile form. However, Lepus says she only stumbled earlier because she has not yet adapted to her body. The young boy's bullies abused him and said that their teacher gave them the permission to beat him up. Espen perceived that the young boy must be a knight candidate for him to have been surrounded by three mean people, so she stood up to protect him. She said that the bully should fight with him one on one, since it's a disgrace for a knight to fight an opponent who has lost their will, and that they're cowards not befitting of the knight title if they only gang up on others. What are you saying, damn bitch? One of the bullies said roughly. As another one went to strike Espen, she wondered how on earth a kid could say such words. She defeated the bullies with much ease, only using a stick to strike all three of them, and when they left, they gave the typical line vowing revenge against Espen and the young boy. Espen was surprised that her body could move swiftly, and Lepus told her that her ability to adapt to her body had helped her to be able to use a sword by default. Then she turned to the boy, and she asked if he was alright. The latter said he was fine, and he thanked Espen for saving him. He said that she was so cool, because he'd never seen his bullies beaten before. For compensation, Espen asked for a place to stay, leaving the boy wondering if she'd gotten kicked out of her house. Just like I'd have to kick you for not liking the video and subscribing to my channel. Come on, I'll be making recaps for shoujo anime, manga, and manhwa like this one. Sharing plenty of fun and exciting stories with all of you, so please hit that subscribe. Please! Anyways, Espen and the boy arrived at a bungalow. Espen could see that the simplicity of the house pale in comparison to the boy's clothes, but she was more surprised that the boy was called a young master. After a short time, different kinds of delicacies were set before Espen and the boy. The boy thanked Espen for helping him, but she told him she was only able to help him at that time and that the bullies might come against him in the future. Espen asked the boy's name and she was surprised to hear the name Senok Black Knight. At first, the name sounded familiar, but later she was shocked to realize that the boy bears the same name as the Captain of the Knights. No, he is the Captain of the Knights. And she was surprised to see that Captain Senok was a weakling when he was a child. After that, the meal ended. She found it difficult to believe that she had gone back to the era where the Captain of the Knights was completely different. She then began having thoughts of returning to her original self, but Lepus warned her to never try searching for her original body. Lepus tells her she must never meet with her original self because both her original body and this new one share the same soul. And if they were to meet, her current soul would erase from this dimension. Lepus promises to grant all her wishes if only she could find the sacred beasts. Regardless, Espen was happy that since she had come to have a new life, not being hated or scorned by anybody, she decides to inquire more on the given quest and ask Lepus about the sacred beasts. 
Sacred beasts are creatures that have enormous power, ranking from village level to wiping out entire countries. There was a dimension in which Lepus gathered and controlled the most dangerous of the beasts. Lepus was in charge of that dimension, but can't use his powers much here because this dimension constrains him. Thus, he needs Espen's help. He tells her to catch sacred beasts that have escaped before they cause trouble. The next day, she met Senok at the manor. She asked if he is taking the night training lessons. The owner of the manor named Count Iset is apparently a vassal of Duke Black Knight. However, because he was a vassal with no power, he abandoned the Senok Manor. Senok asked if Espen would like to see the training ground, so she decided to take a look around so that she could gather information about the sacred beasts. Espen and Senok went to a familiar place and they saw the guys that bullied him the previous day, but they ran away as soon as they saw Espen. She then asked if she could be indebted to Espen one more time because she had nowhere to stay. So Senok replied that she could stay with him as long as she wished which surprised her, but she was more surprised to see that Senok did not ask anything about her identity. She tells him her name is Pin, and tells Senok she wants to help in dealing with the bullies as payment for letting her stay with him. And even though Senok was a little doubtful, she told him to trust her. Tears of joy flowed down from Senok's eyes. No one has ever offered to help him. Espen remembered that the captain of the night in her past life was cold, but had always given kind words to her. She remembered when the captain visited her when she was injured. The captain told her she had been doing well, and he had told her to speak up when she needed any help. At that time, she ignored the captain because she hated him, but she always remembered his words. It's funny how this time, she's able to pat the head of her little crying captain. Remembering that the same person she gave head pats to was Captain Senok in her previous life, it gave her some mixed feelings. She then noticed this was the training ground for swordsmanship and joked about enrolling in it to learn as well. She sensed that it wouldn't be difficult to protect Senok from the sidelines, but the fact that he cannot wield his sword was a mystery to Espen. She thought that there must be something going on. Senok tells Espen his father commanded him to stay close to the manor. Espen asked if Senok would like to go around the town with her since she wants to get more information about the sacred beasts. She holds his hands, looking him straight in the eyes, telling him that if no one cares about him, all he has to do is walk out and meet new people who love and will care about him. Espen did not want to get close to Senok, but she did all that she had done in order to repay his kind deeds. Espen gets lost in her thoughts, thinking about the past, and Senok wonders if everything is alright. While they're speaking, Lepus raises an alarm, telling Espen that there is an emergency. He could sense the energy of a sacred beast in town, so Espen tries to leave. But Senok tells her he will be meeting with his instructor very soon. Espen asks if she could come along with him, and then Senok replies that outsiders won't be able to meet with the instructor easily, since there are a lot of people coming from far away to learn from him. He's very prestigious. He decides he's going to ask whether he needs to attend the training or not because he wants to go along with her. Espen is surprised at what Senok is saying and finds it difficult to adapt to his strangely innocent behavior. Senok noticed the look on Espen's face. He asked if he might be a burden to her. He just wanted to know if she liked him. She replied that she was just thinking about something else. Then she told him not to worry about anything and that she doesn't hate him. She says that she'll go back to town and come back later at night to see Zenok. In town, she asks Lepis the location of the sacred beast. Lepis gave her several directions which are completely useless. Because anywhere a sacred beast has been will leave residual energy. Lepis explains the power of the sacred beast is what humans refer to as miracles. Even with snow beginning to fall on a bright, sunny day, the residents of the town don't even look surprised. Espen walks towards a young man and asks if the snow usually falls at this time of year. The man could tell she was a visitor and explained that snowfall is a phenomenon that has been happening in their region lately. It just suddenly snowed at odd times more recently. He said mages arrived from the capital and declared that there was no problem. But the most amazing thing is that there is nothing dangerous about this snow at all. He had Espen taste it and she was surprised that the flakes were salty. And the man said the first time it snowed, however, it tasted very sweet. Whenever the snow fell, the kids loved it. Lepis explained that there's a sacred beast called the Snow Weaver who produced the ice according to his emotions. Whenever he's happy, the ice tastes sweet. Sad, the ice tastes salty, and whenever he's angry, the ice is hot. She asked if the sacred creature likes or hates anything. Lepis answered that the sacred beast likes human food, but isn't really sure what uh, Ice Weaver likes in detail. Lepis felt a faint aura coming from the alley. Espen goes close to the alley and sees a young boy surrounded by two robbers who are trying to mug him for money. The boy starts lighting up his magic and defeats them. Then Espen arrives to finish them off. The mage's opponents were defeated before Espen arrived at the scene. Espen requested to know mage's identity. He said his name is Cade and that he is a magician. 
Espen remembered that the mages used magical powers and they belonged to the Sky Knights in her former timeline. The Sky Knights is an association of mostly knights and few magicians. The mages who joined the Heavenly Knights wandered or often worked at the towers. Cade felt a strange, lovely sensation and he guessed it must have been some kind of magic nearby. Espen lied to Cade, saying that it was the first time she was meeting a magician and she was so curious. Then they exchanged introductions. With the help of his magic, he picked up the stick she used and wondered if she was a little too young to be wielding it like a weapon. Cade said he'd been working with his master, the Archmage. Then Espen's memory recalled this boy to be Cade Raikune, the future Archmage. When she assumed the post of Lieutenant, the Emperor of the Empire collapsed due to an unknown magic disease. At the time, the mage Cade appeared and he played a crucial part in the Emperor's recovery with his magic. After the Emperor's recovery, Cade suddenly disappeared and no matter how hard the Emperor searched, they could never find him. She was even tasked at some point to search for Cade and is surprised to see him right in front of her. She thought it would be good for her to make friends with Cade. She asked him about his reason for being in town and it turns out he was in town to collect some special treasures. Maybe a harp that could create waves or a rock that could turn into food Food, or even a treasure that could travel through time, which alarmed Espen. Cade mentions he was visiting the town because it suddenly started snowing. Then, Lepus announced the arrival of the Snow Weaver. Espen wondered if this cute little thing really was a sacred beast. The Snow Weaver runs away. Espen and Lepus chase after him. Cade calls out to Espen as he wants to meet her again, but they dash off. At the same time, at the Knight's Training Center, the three bullies surround Senok. They make fun of him because he could not even use a wooden sword. One of the bullies says he's going to break his legs since Espen is not around. So Senok tries to hold out his wooden sword. He summoned courage amidst the loud laughter of the bullies, who found him to be stupid. But Senok swings the wooden sword and surprises them. The leader of the bullies ordered his subordinates to deal with Senok. Espen and Lepus continue to look for the Snow Weaver. Lepus says that the Snow Weaver is hiding because he hates Lepus. And Espen asks why Snow Weaver hates him, but Lepus replies he has no idea, which pisses her off. Espen said if he knew that the Snow Weaver was in town, she would have to catch up with him. She felt that she needed a proper sword like the one she had in her previous life. She went back to meet Senok, who had been beaten by the bullies. Senok stood up from the ground with tears in his eyes. He told Espen that he wants to be strong. He was the most talented knight in the whole empire. His enemies saw him as a nightmare in their dreams, but he was far from that reality now. She asked Senok about his reason for desiring to be strong. Espen told him to wipe his tears away. She said that Senok is going to become stronger sooner or later and concluded that the Senok she knew is different than the original one in her timeline. Espen did not find the sternness, firmness, or rigidity of the captain within him. Espen said that she wants to help him but she also needs his help. She tells him she's going to make him strong and to not go for any training outside of her because she's going to be his teacher. Espen asked if they could get something to eat. So during mealtime, she described the snow weaver as a kid with curly white hair and horns and wearing trousers. And Senok had been drawing the image of the snow weaver, but the image she drew was very funny. She asked Senok about his reason for living in a secluded place instead of the castle. Senok explained that the castle is so cold and hard to bear. The people in the castle would torment him to the point that he would wonder how long he could even survive if he continues to live as a weak person. He thought that he might become useless in his current state. Espen realized that there are more people that need to drink her cup of wrath. Thinking there's no way that she and the future captain would have the same relationship, she reasoned that she would be able to pay Senok for his kindness in feeding her and giving her a place to sleep. She advised that they both go and play and also find something delicious to eat. Senok reminds Espen about his training, but she replies that it won't be bad for the both of them to rest for the day before training, because missing training for one day isn't going to make him weak. We see Snow Weaver walking along the road as he contemplates his master Lepus as evil. He thought about the encounter he had with Espen and it was difficult for him to let go of that experience. It began snowing heavily and unexpectedly again, some people were looking for explanations to the occurrences in town. The Lord is expected to take action since the snow had covered the whole town during the summer. The Imperial family said that magicians will be coming to examine the whole situation as well and the people are advised to wait a little bit. Espen remembered that Lepus said the snow tastes different depending depending on Snow Weaver's emotions. At that moment, she tasted the snow and it was spicy and bitter. Lepus said that the Snow Weaver is more enraged and that the bitterness of the snow represents the Snow Weaver's deep sorrow. 
Espen asked what Lepus thought could be the Snow Weaver's reason for cursing him. Lepus thinks that the Snow Weaver is just a fickle kid. Then, Espen nearly falls on the icy ground, but Senok grabs her hand and drew her to himself in what turned out to be a lovely embrace, and she found his strength to be very impressive. Espen felt that Senok's physical abilities are good, despite the fact that it's difficult for him to use the sword. With the snow and the city's food supplies destroyed, she can't find this beautiful scenery to be romantic. She then asks if Lepus could show him himself to other people, and he definitely can. She then has Lepus show himself to Senok, who is completely surprised to see the cute sacred beast. Espen explains Lepus is the reason she's been looking for the Snow Weaver in town, and even with Espen telling Senok not to be scared of Lepus, Lepus can't help but feel there's more danger with Senok's obsessive traits. With Senok easily accepting Espen's explanation about sacred beasts, she couldn't help but worry about Senok's safety. Elsewhere, Snow Weaver spots a mother and daughter playing in the snow. He thinks of Lepus and gets angry that the master of beasts is nothing like a parent. Snow Weaver decides to attack the family, but Espen narrowly saves the two. Snow Weaver sees the family happy and safe, and then he sees Lepus. He decides to go on the attack, but Espen deflects everything using a stick. The ice magic focuses on Senok, so she protects him too. Look Espen, there's a sword over there, Senok said pointing in the opposite direction. I will be borrowing this, as she took hold of the blade. As it was expected, Senok and Espen cornered the Snow Weaver. A barrel was beside Senok, so he threw it at the beast. Espen then kicks him down, and he transforms into a cute little creature like Lepus. She then picks up Snow Weaver and ties him up with a rope. As Espen was thinking about the reason for the sudden transformation of the Snow Weaver, Lepus explains that sacred beasts revert to the original body form whenever they experience a shock. And then she asks him, why are you always in that steamed bun body? But Lepus disagrees with that statement. With Snow Weaver staring angrily, it begins to snow heavily. Lepus warns Snow Weaver to stop using his powers excessively as he might wipe out of existence and even fade away. It doesn't matter if I disappear or not. You wouldn't care either way, the Snow Weaver screams as he undoes his bindings. He then pushes Espen and runs away. Then Senok appears on top of Espen trying to see if she's alright. She asks if the Snow Weaver had escaped and thanks Senok for helping her earlier telling him he's amazing. You are not useless at all and you've done a good job, Senok said as he was trying to encourage Espen. He held her hands and was trying to pull her up from the ground. The more she looked at Senok, the more the captain's image faded away. As she called Senok her best friend, Lepus reminds Espen that the boy is destined for misfortune. A week later, the snow continues to fall, except more seriously than before, and Snow Weaver was nowhere to be found. Most of the townsfolk adapted, but not everyone is satisfied with having snow at odd times. Many people are angry with the whole situation. Espen felt the knights might arrive soon, and had no chance of forgiving the perpetrator, Snow Weaver. Espen questioned once again if Lepus knew about the reason why Snow Weaver was destructive in nature. He replies he has no idea and then plops himself on Espen's head. He explains that beasts have no concept of family, yet Snow Weaver was always obsessed with being human, even begging Lepus at times for a parental embrace. Perhaps it was because Lepus would pick up Snow Weaver and tame his powers which caused Lepus to make a stupid comment about being a mom. Espen worries that the Snow Weaver will be arrested as soon as the sorcerer arrives. She said she doesn't know how beasts would be treated, thinking that Snow Weaver might be used as an experiment or even killed instantly. Lepus kept quiet. Then Espen assumed that they have to go back. Senok had been waiting for them for a while. In order to save time, Espen suggests that they split up and find the beast. A week later, they reconvene with no progress. Espen still praises Senok for his hard work and noticing the sword on his hip, she's proud of him for carrying the sword he was once afraid of. Espen takes a look at Senok. She could see that he was cute and lovely, but she reminds herself that she was admiring someone who was her captain in her former world. But she can't deny the fact that she now sees two personalities in the person of young Senok. She moved closer to him and touched his hair and was convinced that this Senok was kind. Espen and Senok go about asking people if they've seen the little kid with white hair. A woman said that the person they are looking for is in the alley. Senok and Espen go to the alley. They find someone who looks similar to Snow Weaver. That person happens to be facing the opposite direction. So Espen charges towards the person with a triumphant shout. But as that boy turns his face, Espen felt a huge surge of energy coming towards her. Alas. It was Cade the Magician. Espen apologized for her mistake. She said she mistook Cade for someone else and attacked him accidentally. But it's alright, since he keeps her afloat with his magic. He laughs and says that Espen doesn't look like the type of person who would suddenly attack others. She explains that they're actually looking for Snow Weaver, who is about their age, and Cade has a similar complexion. Cade says that the alley is quite dark and she's likely to mistake him for someone else. But now he wants to know more about the boy 
that's with her. Espen introduces Senok as her friend, who's helping her look for Snow Weaver. Cade then offers to help them look as well, and she replies she's grateful for Cade's kind gesture and asks if he could keep everything they discuss a secret, and he agrees. Espen asks if Cade has heard of the sacred beasts, and Cade asks if Espen is talking about creatures from another dimension. His teacher once taught him that the world is divided into different dimensions, so there must be one where sacred beasts exist. He said that sometimes creatures from other worlds can appear, as well as humans from different time periods. He says that the divine beast is still a concept that a sorcerer finds difficult to understand, so why would Pin know about them? Actually, the person I'm chasing after is... Oh! There he is. Catch him and let's go, Espen said, as she was trying to reveal the identity of the Snow Weaver to Cade and also deflect his question. She saw someone that looks like the Snow Weaver and told Senok to run after that person. They then see the presence of the knights, probably sent to deal with the source of the ongoing snow. Espen then decides to tail the knights, as they might have better resources for finding Snow Weaver. Then the knights split into two directions. So Cade goes one direction himself, while Espen and Senok go the other. Cade said that he has cast a trace spell on Espen, so that he would be able to send a magic signal if he finds the Snow Weaver on his side in case he spots the horned boy. As they follow the knights, it turns out that they also lose the trail of the sacred beast. Espen wishes that Lepis could sense the Snow Weaver's movement, but it seems that the Snow Weaver uses powers to avoid being noticed once again. With Snow Weaver thinking he's gotten away, Espen triumphantly announces, It's game over. You can't run away anymore, Espen says as she flips over to the front of him. Snow Weaver is determined to escape, so he makes a large ice crystal. Espen's concern is that if it crashes, it'll cause too much attention and attract the knights. She decides to put her life on the line. As the crystal falls down on her, she splits it with her sword to prevent it from crashing. She then grabs Snow Weaver, throwing him to the ground while pointing her blade at him. Senok announces the knights are coming. As the loud footsteps draw closer, Cade offers to help. He casts a barrier on the ground and makes it impossible for the knights to see or hear them, meaning Espen doesn't have to hold back. With her strongest technique displayed, Cade remarks no one of this current era has powers like hers, remarking Pin to be a genius. With Snow Weaver tied up, Espen admits that it's been a long time since she had been able to warm up like this. Senok thought that they would need to break down a part of the wall. Till that time, he'd always thought of swords as scary weapons used by scary people, like his father. But he suddenly realized that the sword is not only a terrible and cruel thing, but can also be extremely beautiful. Espen asked if Senok is alright, and Senok says that he is fine, and he's grateful for being able to use a sword. For the first time, he felt no pain and no fear, and confessed that Espen is amazing. This caused her to remember her former captain who had said the same thing. The man who had once told her to be proud of herself, and that the only vice captain in his heart was her. Espen remembered Captain Senok's words, You should have confidence in yourself as my vice captain, a repressed memory of him walking away after praising her. Kay tells them they've got to leave, so they head somewhere more secluded. The Snow Weaver doesn't feel like talking, being interrogated by Espen. Espen then gives Senok a paddle he can use to whack Snow Weaver in case he runs. She said she doesn't want the Snow Weaver to run away again after all that she'd done to capture him. Lepis kept quiet and did not say anything about this. The Snow Weaver once again tells Espen to kill him, but she doesn't care what he thinks. She asks Lepis if he wants the Snow Weaver dead, but Lepis tells her she may not because Snow Weaver belongs to his dimension. She then asks what they should do if he runs away again, and Lepis tells her they just have to catch him again. This leaves Snow Weaver perplexed, as he thought Lepis hated him. However, Lepis explains he doesn't hate him at all. This is when Snow Weaver understood Lepis must really care about him, and Espen explains that even though she hasn't known Lepis for long, Lepis definitely cares about him in his own way, which causes Snow Weaver to cry and jump into Espen's arms in beast form. Seeing the dust settled, Cade wants to know more about Lepis. A week later, since there was no snow, people stopped worrying about trying to find the cause. It seems like all the problems have finally been resolved. Espen begins the swordsmanship training with Senok now. Since Senok had a fear of swords, Espen plans to get him used to fighting with them. The Snow Weaver, Lepis, and Espen end up becoming close friends, and the maid was excited to see Senok and his new friends all playing together. All while Snow Weaver and Lepis call Senok for being a weakling and for getting knocked down during his training. Kate asked if the Snow Weaver is a kind of mythical creature that asks for her help, and her reason for staying at Senok's place while she was looking for the mythical creatures. Espen replied that she has to stay with Senok since she has no place of her own. Then Cade offers his place and his magic skill to search for the beasts. Cade says that she will also get the help of his teacher without giving too much information, causing Espen to light up at the offer. 
She thought the idea sounded good, but Senok cried telling her to stay with him. She tells Cade she can't, and Cade takes his leave. Luckily for Senok, Espen did promise to help him in return for letting her stay. Wondering where the next beast is, we see a small silhouette mentioning the area smells like Snow Weaver. The next day, Espen learns from Cade that some wizards are coming to town. Even though the snow stopped, a wizard from the Sky Guard is being sent to conduct an investigation, which worries Espen. Cade told Espen to stop worrying about the whole situation. He tells her that things will be fine as long as they don't find out that it's the doing of a mythical creature. The Snow Weaver, now known as Weavy, asked if anything was bothering Espen. Espen asked if Weavy knew about the other mythical creatures. He replies that when he opened his eyes to this world, he saw two other sacred beasts with him. He said one went to look for a big bolt of lightning, while the other went to go look for flowers. He said that he was the only one left behind, and narrated how he wandered around till he came to the city. Thus, they must all be scattered in different areas. The head instructor went to meet with Count Iset, who was left in charge of Senok to make him useful for a reward. Senok's instructor informs the Count that Senok has not been attending training for a while now, so the Count decides to take matters in his own hands. At the training ground, Senok asked how Espen got her swordsmanship skills, and she replies she was born talented, which was a joke that Senok took seriously. She actually learned from a master when she was young, a retired Sky Knight who might be serving the Sky Guard right now in this time period. She mentions that there was a genius at the same place she trained, a genius so talented no matter how hard she competed, she could never reach. She used to think she hated him, but admits that secretly she might have been looking up to him this whole time. Senok wonders if she liked that genius, so she coughs and laughs, wiping the tears of laughter saying there's no way she'd like that guy, causing Senok to smile. But then she remembered a time when he had came to her bedside, remarking how deeply she slept, and this caused her to get red flustered. And suddenly, the boys who usually bullied Senok arrive, and Espen drew her sword. One of the boys stops to say they're just here to relay a message from their master, and they learn the instructor is looking for Senok. Espen thought Senok had gotten permission from his instructor to stop going for training. She points the blade at the boys and questions the authenticity of their words. However, the main bully promises on his knight's honor he's telling the truth. The bully then calls Senok a coward and Senok tugs at Espen, telling her he's going to go. He wants to tell his assigned instructor that Hin is his teacher now, causing her heart to go, but um? She wonders what that feeling was. With her concern growing for Senok, she decides to follow him. She tails them trying to hide in the bushes, and learns from Lepus that he can just make her invisible to other humans. She asks him why he never mentioned this before, and when he admits he was just being lazy, the two bicker a bit. She spots the instructor yelling at Senok, and the berating reminded her of how the other knights had treated her. Then we see the Count, telling Senok he's going to be abandoned forever if he keeps acting like this. Espen can't stand to see this go on. As she gets up to confront them, she realizes there's not much she can do while looking like a child. So Lepus offers to make her appear like an adult as a thanks for helping with Snow Weaver. As Count Iset tells Senok he's going to attend classes every day from now on, the adult Pin appears and announces she's the guardian of Senok, causing Count Iset to shrivel back, thinking the Duke sent another noble to look after Senok. Pin also announces she's Senok's teacher, and by the looks of it, better suited than the current sword teacher. Of course, the instructor hired by the Count feels insecure, especially when Pin announces she'll show him how it's done, and he just senses this aura of strength that's beyond him. He decides to win in the only way he possibly could, which is to test her teaching abilities by having his student duel Senok. They agree if Senok wins, he'll be free to do whatever. But the next day, Senok is completely depressed. Kate arrives, noticing the mood is a little gloomy. When Senok asks if he fails, would Pin leave him? She consoles him with the reminder she has no plans of leaving until he's comfortable with the sword. After all, he's her first student. This gives Senok the determination to win. As Cade overlooks the two, we learn he had actually seen Pin earlier after she transformed into an adult. He wonders how she used magic without being a mage, and with so many questions in his mind, he wondered if he should tell his master about this but knows she's going to be confined to the magic tower if he did. A month passes and as the duel is about to begin, we see the training Senok had gone through. Espen acknowledges Senok's talents, as he's able to easily destroy dozens of training dummies. She felt a month was too short to solve all of Senok's issues, so she had Cade place a spell on him that only let him see things he liked in the drill hall during the duel. He saw flowers, grass, clear skies, animals, and Pin. Also, he would no longer see his fears. When Senok clashes with the other boy, he wonders if the bully had always been this weak. Then with a lunge forward, he knocks a sword from his opponent and points his blade, claiming victory. 
As the two boys continue to look at each other, Senok remarks that the bully wasn't such a big deal after all. With Senok's talent displaying fruition, the Count thinks to himself he must tell Duke Black Knight, and also fired the current instructor. We then move to 18 years in the future, where the other Sky Knights are talking crap about Espen. And even though they bash the hardworking and talented Espen, they praise their Captain Senok, discussing rumors of how his father left him alone in the mountains to train, where he earned his title of Prodigy, and wishing at the same time that Espen had been sent there instead, hoping someone finds their lieutenant's corpse. Behind them was a mage named Chloe, who was sympathetic towards Espen, remembering Espen as her only friend. She wonders where she is, remarking Captain Senok's behavior to be strange as of late. Returning to the past, Senok was freed from the Sword Academy. Learning after the instructor was fired, it turns out he had lied about his expertise and was actually a hack. Enjoying the peace, she notices someone watching them from the bushes. Senok approaches, ready to kill, and we see it's one of the bullies. He keeps showing up to learn from the adult Pin, who Espen claims is her older sister. But Espen declines immediately, telling him to leave. Cade then shows up after learning from his master that two wizards from the Imperial Guard are coming to town soon. Count Iset greets these two wizards, hosting the both of them. When the servant trips in front of the two mages, the black-haired one kills the servant instantly for being incompetent, making the Count gulp nervously. However, right behind them, the brown-haired mage notices a cute little creature smelling the flowers. The brown knight, ranked 7, is Cleary, who is curious about the creature. The creature walks right up to Cleary and tells him he smells nice. However, the black-haired mage named Maseth grabs the creature, and even though the creature tells him to let go, he ignores this ecstatic to have found research material. We turn to Espen who remembers her best friend. Chloe's father must be a royal knight in this era. She remembers the time Chloe had told her she had originally studied to be just like him, and that the father and daughter even looked similar. As Weavy munches on the Lepus, Lepus senses the presence of another sacred beast. Espen asks who it is, causing Lepus and Weavy to nervously exchange glances. Weavy remembers this beast like humans and flowers. He then goes into a lesson explaining his medium for magic is snow, and her medium is flowers and plants. However, Espen is more concerned about this beast's personality, and Weavy nervously responds it's best not to make her angry. We transition to Cleary, who tells Maseth that the mistreatment of the mythical creature is unethical and against the wizard's code of conduct. Maseth assures everything is alright, and that this creature must be one he's read about in literature before. Ones that cause abnormal climate phenomena, and can control climate and nature. As the sacred beast yawns, Maseth contemplates their tremendous discovery. What things could they find if they dissected the creature? They might even make history. Maseth reminds Cleary that he's the boss, and won't accept any mutiny as he walks away. Cleary can't help but think Mazeth is greedy, since it's against the wizard's code of conduct not to harm newly encountered living beings. This is when Mazeth's pupil, Reuben, arrives. He brought a blanket, just in case the creature were to get cold. Cleary thinks of Reuben to be too kind to be Mazeth's pupil, reminding him of his daughter, Chloe. After receiving head pats, Reuben couldn't help but wish Cleary was his teacher. Reuben then goes to deliver the blanket, and the creature tells him he's very kind which shocks Reuben to hear it talk as the creature coddles up to the blanket. The sacred beast mentions how Reuben smells like grass, and then takes the appearance of a young girl with flower bulbs on her head. She mentions that she likes humans, and asks for Reuben's help. The sacred beast pokes Reuben, laughing because he's become red like a tomato. Reuben asks her name, and she replies, Flea. Flea has been looking for her friend that looks similar to her. She wants Reuben's help, but when he hears the arrival of someone, he thinks it might be his master, Mazeth, who has come back early. He tells Flea to transform back, because if his teacher sees her like this, he'll for sure start experimenting on her. She changes back and thanks Reuben for helping her. Back in the forest, where Pin and Senok first met, Weavy mentions that Flea is most likely nearby somewhere with a lot of plants. They're having a hard time finding her since she's hiding her powers again. As they continue to search, Espen wonders if Senok has always been so tall. They search some more, and Senok contemplates where Pin is from and why she's looking for the mythical creatures. He asks if she has a last name, and this causes memories to flood in from her childhood. She answers she's a commoner, and that only nobility have last names. Senok then asks what she thinks about marriage between nobility and commoners, and with her sweating and flustered, she says it's fine if they like each other, wondering why he's asking her this. But her answer makes Senok light up. However, it's very clear to Lepis that she's oblivious. Senok wants to know more about her, but when she tries to answer, she can only think of her lying in pain and the flames that consumed her household. 
She lies, saying she's from somewhere far away. They then decide to try searching a town, but all Weavy can think about is what they're having for dinner. Then a man comes running and bumps into Espen. We see it's Cleary and Espen immediately catches on to his resemblance to Chloe. Cleary asks if she's hurt because since he's a wizard, he can heal her. Watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I hope you enjoyed this one, and if you want me to continue this series, let me know in the comments. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.